good to have you here worshiping with us uh, in person today. Uh, we continue to provide videos online of worship for those who are uh, either not able to be here or uncomfortable still uh, being in worship. Uh, but we're glad that you're here with us today. We want you to know that whether you're joining us online or here in person, uh, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us at First Congregational Church. I'm sure that you noticed several things uh, that are different than how we normally worship as you came into the building. Um, all of this is in cooperation with the guidelines that have been out there from the CDC, the state of Connecticut, and our denominational uh, leaders. Um, it's of the utmost importance to us that if we're able to be back in here to worship, that we do it safely. So we ask for your full cooperation in making sure that your mask covers your nose and your mouth, that we stay uh, six feet apart from one another, and that we uh, remember to wash our hands frequently. You have an order of worship provided for you in the bulletin. Uh, it has uh, information about what's happening in the service, as well as prayer requests and uh, announcements on the back side. We would ask that at the end of the service you take that with you, and if you take it home, that's great. You can put it on your cork board or your fridge. Uh, if not, there are recycle bins at uh, any of the doors, uh, so you can drop it in there if you don't want to take it home. Uh, the way we're doing it on the first Sundays of the month, like next month, uh, there will be, uh, when you come in to get your bulletin, you come through the sign-in process, there will also be a self-serve communion kit there, and you pick that up, and we'll still be able to do communion in worship. Uh, you will notice that the pew Bibles and the hymnals have been removed. They're suggesting that for us, or they're, they're saying that for us, we should not be uh, uh, praying out loud or singing out loud because it's one of the ways that the virus is spread. So when you see the prayers listed in the bulletin today and you see the words to the hymns, they're not to speak out loud or to sing. Uh, we would ask that you, um, you can read through the words and hear the music as it's uh, happening, but not to sing out loud. If you brought anything to uh, donate to the church for an offering, you can drop those in the plates that are at uh, either of the door. Um, and uh, we do encourage people to sign up online for e-giving or to mail in their contributions. But we do appreciate all the contributions that help us to maintain the ministries and the outreach that we do, especially during this time of pandemic. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have kids in church school, the teachers will be notified at the end of the service uh, and they'll bring the kids outside to the area where the cones are, and you can pick your kids up there. Uh, the ushers will, the uh, deacons and ushers will dismiss us at the end of the service. And then finally, I invite you to join me on Zoom at 11.15 for a social hour. Um, we've been doing that the last couple of weeks. It's just a half an hour, a time to kind of pop in and say hello, and uh, I'd love to see you there. The invitation is on the bulletin, but it also has gone out in emails this week, so... Now, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Jim and Betsy Maxwell to lead us in worship. Back in March, they were scheduled to lead worship for us as part of our open and affirming initiative. But they both fell ill with COVID, and while Betsy got home after just a few days, Jim spent weeks in the hospital and then weeks in rehab. So we are thrilled that they are well and able to join us today to lead uh, worship. What is open and affirming? As a congregation, we are looking at what it would mean to become a church that declares itself open and affirming, which means that we commit to welcome all God's children in worship, work, mission, and fellowship, regardless of age, marital status, um, gender expression, race, ability, sexual orientation, economic standing, any of those things that can divide us. So we've offered over the year um, a number of different opportunities to learn about the gifts of diversity, about what scripture and Jesus have to say, about um, how to be welcoming and accepting of others, and what it means to be a welcoming faith community. The Maxwell's leadership in worship and the sermon are part of this overall initiative. So would you please welcome Jim and Betsy Maxwell. Good morning. When I tell you that we are happy to be here this morning, I mean we are really happy to be here this morning. Before we begin the service, I've got to take a couple of minutes to thank all of you here 
and out there for including us in all of your prayers. Indeed, the entire church helped us get through this horrific experience. We, for all your support, we began our journey into the COVID unknown. It, it's immeasurable. Whenever one of us, Jim or Kathleen or Jennifer or I, needed encouragement, a note would arrive or a card or flowers or food or a phone call or a text. We literally had prayers for us from around the world. And God is good. Our prayers were answered now.
You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This morning I'm going to tell you why I consider this place and everyone here as my church family. When I was clobbered with my lack of knowing what the Bible said, I was actually happy because when the shock wore off and I had time to reflect, I thought, that's all right. You can think the way you do and I can think the way I do and we can both sit in the same congregation because we are both part of the First Congregational Church of Watertown, Connecticut, United Church of Christ. We both have faith in God's saving grace and a belief in the teachings of Jesus. We both identify as Christians. That's why I love this faith community. No one has the authority to tell you or me what to believe. Each of us came here today from different places in life's journey. Perhaps you grew up in a home where you learned a literal understanding of God's word and there was no discussion of its meaning. Many of us memorized the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed as part of our Sunday school lessons. Perhaps you were encouraged to understand biblical writings as lessons and stories and metaphors about how to live a righteous life. Perhaps you grew up in a home with no understanding of a creator or a sustainer or a redeemer. But today we are all here listening, thinking, understanding, and growing in our faith. You are welcome wherever you are on life's journey. Here we are living in 2020 yearning to grow in understanding our individual relationship with our Creator. This morning we read a statement of faith called United Church of Christ Statement of Faith in the form of a doxology. I copied this right out of the New Century Hymnal. This is not a cradle church guided by a doctrine written over a thousand years ago, but we do have a statement of faith. We could spend hours studying this United Church of Christ statement of faith, but today I just want you to recognize that it is a statement of faith. It is not the statement of faith of the UCC. It is not a creed that you might recite during worship, but rather it is an affirmation of faith 
written in inclusive language. About 20 years ago, Betsy and I had the privilege to participate in a UCC General Synod held that year in Columbus, Ohio. We participated in the discussion about this statement with the gentlemen who led the committee that developed this statement for the UCC. He was adamant that we understood that this was not the official statement of faith of the UCC, but that it was an understanding of our relationship with our Creator. It is not a creed, a document to stand for all time, a fixed formula of core beliefs. It is a living statement. Today, we are celebrating diversity. I believe this congregation is a reflection of our Watertown community, diverse in ethnic heritage, diverse in faith formation, diverse in financial well-being, diverse in formal education, diverse in sexual orientation, diverse in our understanding of our Creator. To illustrate this diversity of thought, I'm going to share with you two stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is a short story I recently read about Leonardo da Vinci. This story comes from a 2019 novella by T Tim Tigner entitled Leonardo and Gabriel. If you immediately thought of the archangel Gabriel and the Renaissance luminary Leonardo da Vinci, you would be correct. In this story, Leonardo da Vinci has a problem. It's a serious problem, the soul-wrenching kind of problem, the career-killing kind of problem. He needs to finish a piece for the Pope, but he doesn't know how. He has been painting a mural of the Last Supper. He has been working on it for several years, and the tableau is complete, with the exception of the face of Judas and the face of Jesus. He is sure he can figure out the face of Judas, but how do you paint the face of God? Leonardo stares at the blank spots on the painting. He tires and falls asleep and dreams. And the angel, Ar the angel Gabriel appears to him in a dream. Gabriel says, I'm going to help you know God wholly and completely. Since all religions tout themselves as the one true path to knowing God, and all sacred texts have been written by men, I'm going to show you another way to know God. He says, first, let's step away from the image of God as an old man in a white robe holding a mighty wand. Let's think of God as a force, a mighty force. In multiple dreams, Gabriel and Leonardo define God's abilities, God's characteristics, and God's actions. They include God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God is eternal. God is worthy of worship. God started everything. God was the first force of the universe, the first impetus of all action. God is the creator. God created the universe and all that is in it. And God is judgment. God judges. Leonardo awakens and returns to his painting. He knew that he could paint the face of Judas. All he had to do was paint the face of his nemesis, Prior Jeffrey, but he is still stuck on painting the face of the Almighty. Enter Gabriel again in the last dream. Gabriel summarizes We describe God as a force rather than as a man in a flowing robe. Since God is asexual, that is, neither male or female, we decided that the word it is a more proper pronoun for God than the conventional he. Even with all this, Leonardo says, we still have to solve for God. 
Yes, says Gabriel. You have known God all along. You know God, since by definition, God is always with you. How is that possible, asks Leonardo. Gabriel replies, God wears yet another name. You know God as time. That's weird, says Leonardo. If you think about it, time is more than a measurement of existence. Time must be a force. If you take away time, what is left in the world? Leonardo and Gabriel apply time to all God's characteristics. The force of time fit each attribute. This led to the idea that God is time. Leonardo now knew that the Son of God had only to be a human reflection of God's benevolent force. With fresh understanding, he finished painting the face of Jesus. Wow, that's kind of far out. But as I read and I reread the story, it began to make sense to me. God is with me always. Jesus told me that. If time is God, God has given me time. God is time. My goodness, this is an interesting understanding of the Almighty. This is engaging God with an open mind. Many of you know that I was sick earlier this year with COVID-19. I was hospitalized for five weeks on a respirator for 28 days. The machine breathed for me and kept me alive. I was in a rehab facility for six weeks, learning how to stand, to walk, to eat, to bathe, etc. Jim Robertson asked me to reflect on how my faith sustained me in this trial. I don't pray to God with requests or appeals because I am always in conversation with God. What I do realize is that I never felt alone. I was never afraid. Jesus taught, do not be afraid, and I am always with you. My second story is a little lighter. It's about us. The people of this congregation, it is about the New Century Hymnal. Yes, this resource we have now had for more than 25 years. This story is an example of the difficulty of accepting change. This church used the Pilgrim Hymnal for so many years that the congregation and the senior choir were not here to remember the clamor about the changes from the previous hymnal to the Pilgrim Hymnal. Change was difficult back then, too. With the New Century Hymnal, we had to use all-inclusive language. Gone were the these and the thous and mother's arms and the classical words of our beloved Christmas carols. These changes have been so difficult that we still insert into our Sunday bulletins copies of the hymns the way they were. The language of King James is gone, folks, <laughs> but not in my songs or in my prayers. <laughs> what do you think of this prayer that's in our hymnal? Our Mother, <coughs> Father, who is in the heavens, may your name be made holy, may your dominion come, may your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread we need, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not put us to the test, but res rescue us from evil. For yours is the dominion and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That may be too much to swallow, but it is the same message we all know by heart. In conclusion, I believe that the Bible is a very special and authoritative piece of world literature. It was written by men who were telling their understanding of the divine. The Bible tells of one culture's interaction with the divine over time. The story begins with a nomadic clan relating to the divine in complex ways. 
Then comes along a person from the community who is able to speak divine truth in humanity's own voice. His brief physical presence on earth was so compelling that the course of history changed. He embodied divine love and light and believed that ordinary folk, you and me, can do the same. I believe Jesus Christ represents moral truth. He embodies love and love is the eternal moral truth. Don't you read the Bible? The mantra of the United Church of Christ is, God is still speaking. I should hope so. We are all part of a diverse humanity. My church, this church, celebrates the will of grace, of love, of time, of love, of life, and of time. Amen. When we entered the church this morning, we had the opportunity to offer our tithes and offerings. Many of us give electronically, and we are thankful for that convenience. Please pray with me. All good gifts around us come from you, O God. You have given us life and new life in Christ. As you have given us gifts, so we offer our gifts that we may be gifts to one another, even as Jesus so taught and lived.
As we prepare to leave this worship service, hear this benediction. Jesus said, you are always to pray and not to faint. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, but for power equal to your tasks. Then, doing the doing of your work will be no miracle. You will be the miracle. Every day you will wonder at yourself and the richness of life which has come to you by the grace of God. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.